just understanding how close the family is in this this kind of quiet and simple part of a life that was so global and big and extraordinary kind of understand why they would choose to have a, a private moment at the end that that burial being just for close close friends and family yeah. there'll be no cameras there just a moment for her closest circle yeah. to you know, say you bring goodbye. Up, you bring up another point I, I think the Carters were really good at least for those of us looking from the outside about how they were able to mix public and private. I mean, they were really good at it. A lot of politicians, national politicians, are not very good at it. And as a result, they find themselves immersed in a lot of criticism and their lives aren't very successful, quite frankly. But the, the Carters were really good at that, of creating time for family, time for friends, and then mm -hmm. the public life. It, it was a, a sort of, at least from the outside, it seemed like a seamless kind of dance for them. Yeah. I just had this memory as I'm watching the, this, this procession here make its way around the corner. Remember on inauguration day when they got out of the yep. vehicle? Hand that in was, hand. That was the first time that had ever happened, but they had decided that they wanted to make a statement that we are accessible and we, you know, are, are kind of a new regime of, of being of the people and, and they wanted to walk down Pennsylvania Avenue hand in hand and, and be amongst the people that had put them in the White House. And just what that really says about who they are. And as you said, Jeff, we're able to maintain that for so many decades, to maintain that level of accessibility and humility just and do so much. Well, in do you, this you world. remember the criticism. You may be, you're old enough probably, all of us are. I'm not that sure. But. Uh, I, I remember him carrying his own luggage. Remember that? He would carry his own suit over to Air Force One, and it was unprecedented. The thought of his predecessors having done that. You know, President Ford was a, a pretty casual guy for the most part, but Richard Nixon, LBJ, JFK, Eisenhower, Truman, FDR, those were, those were not necessarily the kind of guys who were going to carry their own luggage. Well, throughout, we have seen that they have kind of blazed the trail mm -hmm. um, for uh, how things operated mm -hmm. following their presidency now it's, it's very commonplace to see a new first family walking mm -hmm. um, getting out greeting people and as you mentioned that started with them uh, we mentioned just a short time ago about the former first lady Rosalind Carter taking that briefcase every day to an office to get down to business right. and and do some work and that revolutionized the office of the first lady and uh, took her beyond the role of just being a hostess right. someone who selected flowers in China and hosted parties uh, it was so much more. She was present. She was involved. And uh, as many people have been saying over the last few days, she was a true partner to former President Carter, really weighing in, sharing her opinion, and, and wanting to not just say what she thought, but also give informed opinions, making sure that she knew what she was talking about before she gave that information uh, to the president. You know, her aide for many years at, at the White House, they remained friends until the final day. And she would say if she heard heard about a decision that the president was making that she didn't agree with, she'd get on the phone and talk and say, here's, here's why I think you need to consider that. I mean, it was that kind of level of involvement. She uh, was rejected in Washington, D.C. when the Carters first won the election and went to D.C. Uh, she found that she was being frozen out of a lot of circles and uh, really her entire stay there was a very, very difficult one. She uh, was from a different place in America at a time when the bias toward the South was real. All you have to do is go to YouTube, take a look at some of the national reporting from the networks and look at how awful and how biased it was toward the South of stereotypes. And she found that she was not embraced. She was not part of Washington, D.C. culture, mm -hmm. even as the First Lady of the United States. And as we watch this procession, we see uh, the pastor of the Carters, Tony Loden, walking mm -hmm. down that street ahead of this hearse carrying the former First Lady. And we see this honor guard uh, following behind as well. Mm -hmm. So this is really a, a stirring moment as they are moving very slowly throughout this community of Plains, Georgia, giving people that last and final moment that we will have with the former First Lady. 
As we look at the flowers there, the spray over her casket, reminded of the story John Shirk was sharing about some of her flowers that bloomed two days before her passing, but two months ahead of schedule, and the significance that her loved ones felt that that, that had as yeah. for a woman who loved flowers, and, 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 and some of those are, are on the casket as we see it drive by. The Carters are such a symbol of the New South, the, the emergence of the South as an economic power. I mean, you can even take a look at how the NFL has come here and and uh, you know the NBA how professional sports franchises have come to the south something that was quite frankly not imaginable back mm -hmm. in the 1950s and 1960s how these cities of Atlanta of Nashville of Charlotte are absolutely booming in the United States and and the Carters were really part of that first symbol that wave of what was to come isn't it amazing how that at the end of the li of life you can look back and sort of see the full picture because mm -hmm as her oldest son was sharing in the service today he was talking about you know this strong woman who at 19 almost 20 gave birth and then he was telling stories about when his dad was away at sea and she had three little boys at home and she's trying to go to the grocery store on a bus and carry kids and groceries and and just you see the whole picture of an extraordinary life and every facet of it from those days you know as as a as a young young mom with a naval husband overseas to to what we know now of a lifetime of accomplishments. It starts to make sense. Yes. When you hear these stories yeah. of the things that she did, being valedictorian mm -hmm. out of high school after having to help and step step up and be a caregiver for her grandfather and younger siblings following the passing of her father, mm -hmm. having to help her mother, it all makes sense. What we have seen throughout the, the rest of her life, hearing these stories, these, these things just seem incredible already for a young person to have to step in and help the family, for a young person to be doing those things and still be valedictorian uh, to go to school in a time when when most women weren't able to get college. higher education yeah. and then see the things that she did later it really just clicks it makes sense knowing the person right. and the things that she went through the life experiences that she had all preparing her for uh, the the White House and the the decades of service that would follow uh, you know we talk about uh, a lot about mental health and caregiving, but there was also affordable housing, the work with the, the Habitat for Humanity and childhood immunizations, the election monitoring all over the world. There really was a tremendous amount of work that was done by uh, Mrs. and Mr. Uh, Carter following their presidency in all of these things that we have uh, have been talking about and, and reflecting upon for the last few days really seem like they were just preparing them for the, the later stages of the things that they were doing mm -hmm. that truly made a difference. Look, ma marriage is hard uh, for anybody. <laughs> and, and to be able to keep it together for 77 years, and their marriage was a partnership. It mm -hmm. was this equal footing and we've heard a lot about that uh, during the services of the last two days I, I'm really struck by that mm -hmm. how you, you know a, a marriage of 77 years ago that was so modern by current standards in terms of an equal household and and uh, that in itself is a, another rarity about this couple and these lives that are head shaking that wow well, and, and for all the eras that they lived together, you know, President Carter would often talk about in the early days, he would say I was kind of a arrogant Navy man who didn't consult my wife on things. He did not tell her he was going to run for the state Senate. The story goes that she sees him put a suit on and says, where are you going? He said, oh, I'm going to start a campaign. That's where it started to where it's ended. And he said, then I realized, like, no, she is my partner. She's my equal. And I thought it's so significant that what he shared publicly after her passing was the statement about she was my equal and partner in everything in life and that's something that evolved and and that they solidified deeply over time i think that is so significant and for it to go from that to people saying he he wouldn't have been as successful in politics without her being in his corner without her being at, at his side and in working uh we heard yesterday talks about uh the former first lady using the experiences she had working in the family store uh, and taking that out on the road during the campaign trail and and being able to relate to people because she had that experience the things that she was doing she was bringing her own life 
uh, to that campaign as well. You know, you were talking about Habitat for Humanity. I spent two weeks with the Carters in Haiti, and she was on the site with a tool be belt every moment that he was. They'd walk hand in hand to the bus to go to the to build site. And when there were breaks, you know, in the day for water or snacks, what she would do is kind of peel off, and you'd see her with the children and spending time with the children and checking on people. And it was just always thinking about who's my next touch point. And I thought, you know, she could have made the decision, well, you know, construction, you go off and do that. But they did that together always. And she would be driving nails into a piece of wood right alongside him, like extraordinary strength late into her 80s. She'd oh, yeah. still be on build sites. Yeah, I, I'm reminded of a line that, that I heard from a political pundit one time describing the Carters as having uh, ambition of the spirit. And I mean, it really is true. It's one thing to have ambition toward higher offices, uh, ambition toward making more money, but mm -hmm. their ambition was uh, otherworldly. I mean, yeah. it, it truly was. It was about the spirit and about the betterment of others and what can I do to help someone in need. And that continued for so long. Um, it, it really is incredible because, you know, so many times people can, they, they can retire and, <laughs> and shift their focus away from work, but right. they have continued on with their efforts all across the world, speaking up, if nothing but making a comment and sharing a, a belief about different things that have been going on through the Carter Center. We are seeing that work continue. And you may have noticed over uh, the, the past few days of services, there have been very few flowers. You know, normally when you think about a, a funeral or services, uh, there are just these, these massive arrays and arrangements of flowers. And we understand that the, um, the family and Mrs. Carter wanted, instead of money to be spent on those flowers, for those monies to be sent to the Carter Center to continue that work. I think what you're seeing right now in Plains as they walk toward uh, the final resting spot is uh, I think maybe a tip of the cap or a nod to the inauguration parade where they got mm -hmm. outside of the car with the Secret Service where the agents slowed down, uh, the vehicle slowed down, and they walked. And it had never been seen before. There's a, a famous Willard Scott, the famous Today Show uh, weatherman, who was along the parade route, who went out and uh, was able to join the Carters. And it, it was like a national sensation. And it just wasn't done that way. Mm -hmm. And they did things differently. Mm -hmm. and, and even in death, they are doing things a little bit different. It absolutely feels like a full circle moment. As the procession heads towards us, you'll see uh, in the distance our, our family members, uh, four children, 11 grandchildren, 14 great grandchildren. As they get closer, notice uh, many of them are wearing lays around their necks. We noticed that in, in the service as well. And we have learned that they were gifts from longtime family friends who live in Hawaii who didn't want to be named but wanted to share that gesture. Of course, the Carters had been stationed in Hawaii often said they felt like it was a place that felt like heaven on earth. So that explains um, the lays around the necks. We saw that on Amy Carter's necks, a, a number of, of family members. So you'll see that as they, they pass by, and that's the story behind those There is flowers. that famous Hawaiian story about the Carters where Jimmy Carter had a baby on the way, and he was frustrated. He didn't have any money. They were totally broke for the most part. They were just having a hard time making ends meet, and they needed to buy a bed, and they were pricing a bed around Hawaii, and they saw how expensive it was for a child, he decided he was going to figure out how to make a bed and thus began his interest in woodworking, mm -hmm. which for the rest of his life was uh, uh, certainly a, a, a big part of that life. You would mm -hmm. see him on North Highland at the woodworking shop that's there in Virginia Highland mm -hmm. taking classes in the 1980s. And that was the gift that his staff gave him was a power saw, uh, a, a, a tool. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not doing a very good job describing the kind of power bench and all of that. Mm -hmm. But it was a gift from the staff that they had purchased at Sears. Yeah, and they talked, uh, I believe it was yesterday during the service, about a, a table that he built for Rosalind mm -hmm. uh, for her to use and have at, at the church at Maranatha Baptist Church and how the table is still there at the church. It raised a today. lot of money with his with his woodworking, which, as you might expect, is just sensational. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the pieces that he has done are, are amazing. There is a piece that he made for his grandson that is still in the high school in Plains even today as the hearse passes here and we'll see her loved ones walking along behind it.
of this has been choreographed so extraordinarily the last couple of days, and we shouldn't be surprised by that. Mm -hmm. uh, Chip Carter told me that uh, a couple of years ago that, and, and he just sort of casually talked about he had to deal with his father, and and his father was ever the U.S. Navy man, and that he was always looking at his watch, at his clock. He had everything was in a compartment of time that he had he was so organized in everything that he did every aspect of his life personal professional uh, was always dictated by the clock mm -hmm. and uh, he was never late he was always adhering to time I'm sure that's a story many people who have have military backgrounds are, are very f extensively familiar with. You see these mm. uh, family members walking down the street of planes and you see the neighbors, the community mm. members following down along the sidewalk because this really is an extraordinary moment for this community saying goodbye to Rosalind Carter mm. and also a moment in history for them as well. It is really, I think, touching to see that image of people on the sidewalk they like they just don't want it to end they want to walk along beside her they don't want to stop you know and people of all ages you see some kids yeah. there too um, I just think it really speaks to the the legacy and the lasting impact and I thought it was poignant when the when the pastor said now take her spirit continue her work help change the world that is what she would have wanted it's certainly what former president carter continues to to want that whole area through there has given us uh, two great leaders from the 20th century uh, senator sam nunn from perry georgia which isn't that far away from plains and uh and and certainly uh, uh president carter uh in in plains but uh, those, those are two heavyweights uh, pretty much in the same zip code. You think about in this, in this small town, in this small town of Plains, population about 500, you think of Rosalind Carter as a teenage girl at her friend Ruth's house with a picture on the wall of Jimmy Carter and she says, oh, you know, that's kind of, she says, how she fell in love with him. Like all these monumental moments that happened in this little small corner of Georgia, small yep. corner of the world, uh, who could have known the far reaching impact, you know, she would go on to be, you know, a presidential medal of freedom winner. She, she wrote that book, First Lady from Plains was her first book, I think mm -hmm. published in the 80s. And, and then to think about the message of the eulogy today, the First Lady, not just of Plains, not just of Georgia, not just of the United States, but really a First Lady of the world. Yeah, and I think that global impact is uh, a piece of that legacy that we, we cannot forget because it wasn't just that she was taking trips and visiting, she was going to these countries in doing work, meaningful work, that really left an impact on these communities, whether it was monitoring elections to make sure they were safe and fair, or whether it was health-related, like uh, eradicating the uh, guinea worm. There were so many different projects of passion that the Carters had that took them across the world, and it really did make a difference beyond the borders of the United States. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, you, you talk about all of these great passions of their the Carter Center was one of those passions. Mm -hmm. When I was here in the early 1980s, uh, I think there were a lot of people around here thinking, well, this is just a presidential library, right? I mean, we've always thought about presidential libraries in the context of maybe Abilene, Kansas, and Eisenhower, Amana, Iowa, and Herbert Hoover. I mean, you, you can go on and on with U.S. presidents in small towns having some sort of impact. But this was something different in a big city, and this was not going to be a place where you're going to go and you're going to see curios of the first family. You were going to go and see a saddle they had ridden a horse on or something. Yeah. This was something radically different, but we didn't understand that at the time or really what it was going to be. President Reagan came here for the opening, I believe it was, uh, in, in the fall of uh, 1985 or late summer. And, and at that time, there was just a sense of wonderment from a lot of us who lived here about what exactly the Carter Center would be, what sort of role would it play locally and globally. So here we are, 40 years later, I think we have a pretty good sense of just how important it has been to us locally and globally. And good for us to understand the treasure it is and that it very well may not have been. Mrs. Carter talked about that when they left the White House, you know, they
they kind of came back and assessed where their businesses were and and they had not been handled well while they were in office so they come back to find out they're about a million dollars in debt right. and that's why he started writing books and the two of them needed to make money to, to pay off debts but here is a, a one-term president and first lady who want to build a library and think it's going to be impossible to raise the money and support to do so but got that accomplished and we still benefit from that to this day here in the city of Atlanta and far beyond and and speaking of that that book writing I think they said yesterday during the services that was one of the most <laughs> difficult things they did together as a couple writing a, a book together and um, here we are later with so many different works from from each <laughs> each of them I mean there's so many things to talk about with the Carters yeah. and when you talk about the Carters you talk about both of them and yeah. they are forever a team and I, I was just standing here and, and had a memory kind of flashback from 2014 when Jason Carter was running as the Democrat against the incumbent uh, Nathan Deal uh, it was a sort of pick'em race initially in the polling and the Carters were out in full force as a family I mean Jimmy Carter was I, I still remember the video here at 11 Alive of he was out with his arms stretched out lock him up calling for you know <laughs> he was just passionate trying to do what he could uh, to get Jason Carter <laughs> over the hump and over Governor Deal that of course did not happen but I mean, they just hadn't lost any of their fuel, any of their fire or their passion. Even as an older couple, they were still out, you know, across the state of Georgia doing all they could campaigning in a way that they understood.